thank you for having me. All right, so image I think we're all familiar with, but what comes to mind when you see this image? Maybe the Earth? I don't know, call out anything. Planet? <laughs> Climate change, maybe our oceans. Depends what state of mind you're in, maybe. But all of those are completely reasonable, right? I think completely reasonable things to be, you know, to, to experience as your internal state when you see this image. Well, last year I was in Washington, D.C. I was at a planetarium with my two and a half year old daughter, and we're watching Journey to the Sun. It's completely dark and frankly, completely quiet as well. And all of a sudden, she louds it, yells out as loud as she can, minions. <laughs> so, yeah, which sounds pretty crazy, but it makes complete sense when you realize and think about that her experientially established prior of that image, which is exactly what she saw when they zoomed out during Journey to the Sun, as they often do in these movies, is coming from this image. So for my daughter, as far as she is concerned, you know, she sees an image of the Earth and, and thinks of little yellow creatures, which I, I've got to worry about another time, but for now I'm just fine. You know, it's getting a really critical issue, which is the idea that we each experience a different reality. Every one of our realities is completely different. And the information that is rarely the same that comes in to our experience of the world. Our brain is constantly making inferences about information in the world and about our sensory expectations. And it's taking this information about from each of us. It's based on our biological priors, our experiential priors, and our expectations. And that amalgamated information is enabling us to make critical decisions, whether it's getting to escape danger, to find a mate, or the ability to simply communicate. And all of these things are differentiated for us in ways that are determined and driven by the nature of our experiences. The statistical nature of every one of our experiences, you know, from the features that we experience, whether we grew up in a village in Afghanistan, or a town in the US, or in Europe, or in a city like Kathmandu, or New York, from the colors, the contours of that environment, the pressures of interacting in an auditory scene, in an acoustic environment where our brain is having to solve different problems, the noise levels of those environments, they all shape our ability to experience information. And they all lead to each of us. Our brains are fundamentally different and respond differently to the exact same information in the world. And this is a critical part of how we're thinking about different information. And fundamentally, the fact we all have different experiences is at our core, but it's something we like to keep to ourselves, or we like to believe we have cognitive control over how we reveal the differences in our internal experiences, because I promise they're there. As humans, we like to believe we have our poker face, that our beliefs, how hard our brain is working, our internal states, our, whether our internal states, our anticipations, our emotions, our feelings, how hard our brain is working to solve a problem presented to us in env our environments, that we have the cognitive capacity to drive this and to change and determine when it happens. But I believe this is in our past, and I realize that might sound scary to many of you, and we have entered fundamentally an era of the post-poker face era. And I believe this is going to come with significant cultural, and it's going to introduce a significant cultural and technological evolution where we have to interact with each other and with our technology in a different way, in a way where our technology will know more about us than it ever has. It will be more in tune and aware of our internal experiences than it ever has been before. And with that, it's going to also mean a new unprecedented stage of authenticity. And what we deal with, how we deal with that is going to be a significant part of what we have to think about and how we shape our future. So 
cute monkeys. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time, in, I'm, I'm, at this point in my life, I'm a technologist, but I do, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist from my past. And I spent a lot of time working with different species uh, throughout my evolving career. And I spent many years working with a particular species, a common mar marmoset. Uh, mar the common marmoset is an amazing animal. It's a non-human primate, and it's native to Brazil and the Amazon. And one of the things that comes with being, and there are New World monkeys, and when you are in the Amazon, you're in a rainforest. And one of the things that happens when you're in a rainforest is you can't, you lose one sense, which is vision becomes your sight, becomes a less informative way of communication, because frankly, it's, there's a lot of leaves and a lot of trees, and you can't communicate as well. So the other senses start to get augmented in ways that you can interact with your group and the colony. So marmosets have an extensive vocal repertoire. They also have a, a very strong chemical interaction. The, the way they communicate chemically between each other is quite rich. And I think it's a particularly interesting thing. So you can take a female, the dominant female in a marmoset colony secretes pheromones that actually cause the ovulation of all of the other females in the family group to suppress. This is biology controlling her, her biology, her mental state is controlling the biology and the intera social interaction of all the other animals. You can take the d a non-dominant female out of that colony and put her in the same proximity with a different social role, a different mental state, and she'll start ovulating almost immediately. You've got a situation where the Everything that's coming from the animal, the, bio, the pheromones and the biological signal is being represented and broadcasted to the chemical interaction of the species and causing a social interaction. And I believe that the amalgamation, now if we step back, human pheromones, that's already a very hotly debated topic in science, whether, whether they exist, whether they're useful, how we might sense them if they at all, those things are all up in the air. And I think things that we go back and forth if we look at the scientific evidence. But nonetheless, I think most people believe that we do chemically communicate. And moreover, we give off these signals, we give off deterministic signals of our underlying internal states. And those deterministic signals in the past, perhaps, while science is chasing an el evasive or elusive uh, chemical signature, technology is moving rapidly forward with the sensitivity, the capacity, and the sensitivity of amalgamated sensing and AI in the environment that a lot of those deterministic signals and how machine learning and AI is putting them together are enabling us to see a much richer interaction between each other and our internal state is something that we have to take into account and can help change our technology of the future. So with the amalgamation of sensors on us, around us, and in our environments, I believe we're getting to a place where the signals and tells that give us away, those reveals are becoming quite obvious. I like to step back and say something here. So the capacity of these amalgamated ubiquitous sensing has really transformed us. And it's a scary thing. And when we talk about it, people get, I think we all go into a very, well, what's that world look like in the future? And there's, <laughs> we have to think about it. But there's a popular meme, which um, I, I really like to call out because it takes us back to, you know, how much transformation we adopt it when accessibility and capacity is on, you know, accessibility and uh, convenience is on the table. So many of you have probably seen this, uh, heard this meme, but let's, let's look at 1998. 1998, what was our mantra? Our mantra was, okay, from your, mom, from, from your parents maybe to your kids would say, okay, don't get in cars with strangers and don't talk to people on the internet, right? So literally, uh, 2018, literally summon strangers from the internet to climb into your car, right? And we've gone through uh, this huge ride-sharing evolution that has put us in a place of, you know, what are we after in these cases? We're after convenience, we're after, after accessibility. Both of those things have drived us, driven us to have to evolve in what we consider safe, how we deal with safety, the regulations around some of these things we've had to catch up in many cases. But critical to all of this is being proactive to think through that future and what it might look like. Now, 
I think we are at a similar juncture right now with our regard to how we intersect with each other and with our technology. We are fundamentally approaching a time where technology will know more about us than we might know, and technology will need to proactively shape us, and we need to proactively shape that interaction with technology. So let me step back for a moment. Um, let's think about some of the ways this is happening. Uh, time series. Uh, looks like a, some, you might, it's a simple time series. Uh, maybe it looks like periodic. It might look like a cardiac signal. But the real question, I'll tell you, it's actually measuring skin conductance. And some of these things you can measure on sensors. I'm particularly interested today you know, with sensors on body. I'm particularly interested with sensors in our environments and things that we can get without even having to engage in a device on our bodies. But so I'll tell you it's measuring skin conductance. But the question is, what are they watching? So this is someone watching some content. Any guesses? How'd you know? <laughs> you got it right. All right, so this is someone watching a football match. And I can tell you this particular individual is not, not specifically, you know, doesn't watch a lot of football and absolutely had no particular care about any one of these teams or preferences. But what it gets at here is the reveal. Something as simple as your skin conductance you can't get away from that signal, that anticipatory human signal that is perfectly predicted in that time series for every time there's a penalty kick about to happen. Whether you are engaged, that experience, that feeling is something, it's a deterministic response that your body gives away. And whereas we held those things in before, we're getting to a place where technology can read them and is reading them. Uh, facial recognition, I think that's something that very hotly talk, talked about topic as well. But you know, emotion tracking through facial, you know, uh, facial movements has been around for some time. What's changed in the last few years and is getting even better is I like to say it's like now technology, machine learning, and AI are less about trying to decipher the motion. It's more about being able to call us out and keep us honest. It's on some level now we can, AI and machine learning can detect whether you know, it's a real, we're giving off a real smile or a fake one, or whether we're exuding a true emotion or a fake emotion or some, a synthetic emotion. It can know when someone is acting. Our eyes give away our poker face. They reveal a great deal of information about our internal experiences. And we've studied the responses of our pupil and our eye in many different directions in neuroscience. Now, I want you to listen to the two talkers and watch the diameter of the pupil. Initially, it will, <clears throat> it should be hard, but then one of the talkers is going to drop out, and you should see it change in the diameter of the pupil, okay? Let's. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. 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 I want to watch that one more time, but what I want you to realize is the diameter of your pupil gives away how hard your brain is working. It also gives away how engaged you are in a conversation. These are things that you can't, your autonomic nervous system is driving your pupil to dilate when your brain is having to work harder, and it contracts when it's not. And this can go, these are signals that your body is, the, for the most part, you can potentially, some people can learn with great practice to compensate or to drive, I mean, we can always mentally drive these signals because these are representing some aspect of your mental state. But I want you to watch it again, and I promise your eyes are doing the same thing. Data. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. Intelligent Today's technology, technology depends on personal data. data. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. I promise your pupils are doing the same thing as the subject in your, our lab, whether you want them to or not. Our bodies radiate our stories. You can see it, um, you can represent it in the form of a thermal image behind me where reds are hotter and blues are cooler. But what we can track are the dy dynamic thermal responses that are exuded that can be measured from the changes in your physiology. 
they give away how hard your brain is working, your stress levels, whether you're engaged in a conversation you might be having at a particular moment in time. We can even track regions on people's faces and be able to identify whether they are experiencing an image of fire as if it were real. We actually did this in some of the development of our technology. We're able to identify that you know, people were, when, when the luminance or contrast got high enough on, a, on an image of fire, people actually, their bodies would give off heat that we could pick up with a thermal image, thermal camera. Now, that starts to become an objective metric, an objective way of really talking about what it means to have an immersive experience when your body is truly engaging with it as if it were in nature. But I like to take it to next level. So what if dimensions of data from your thermal response became part of how we interact in the world, part of how we see an aspect of interpersonal interest? Maybe um, you know, AR, the future of AR involves some aspect of amplifying certain dimensionality of your thermal response in a way that it's how we fall in love and see attraction in terms of giving ourselves another dimension. But what's important here is it's an unparalleled level of authenticity and honesty that has never really been present. Uh, critical to it is always that we have to be, you know, engagement, transparency to engagement. When you work with new technologies and introduce them, it's critical that people know that they're actually interacting with that technology. That's a, a really a fundamental part. The dynamics of our voices, how we speak, gives away a rich landscape and insight of our internal experiences. The integrative capacity of technology to objectively assess and integrate across time will enable us to know more about us than we ever have. I think it's very soon that with machine learning and AI and hearable devices, that they can uh, become very informative in ways that they will, they will know more about us than we do. So what we, if we look at different conditions, um, people have shown in the past, uh, groups have shown with machine learning and AI, algorithms looking at the, our syntactic complexity, our semantic coherence can predict the likelihood someone will develop psychosis. You can take it a step further and look at many different conditions. So we can look at Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, heart conditions. All of these have signatures in our speech. With diabetes, there are spectral coloration changes in our voices. With all, with Heart, with heart disease, you can end up with changes in the spectral coloration that are introduced from changes in introduction of air into the, 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 the speech patterns of someone. Alzheimer's, the speech changes that appear with Alzheimer's can sometimes, appear, you can see changes in someone's speech sometimes 10 years before clinical diagnosis. What we say and how we say it tells a much richer story than we used to think. And devices we already have in our homes could give us invaluable insight if we let them. In one case, psychologists and, and computer scientists paired up and just looking, I don't know that I want this at all, but just looking at the patterns of uh, dynamics and tone of a couple, they could predict when, with reasonable timing, whether the couple, when and whether the couple would separate without even looking at what they actually had to say, which maybe is the problem, first of all, in that relationship. But let's <laughs> definitely not sure that we want that. But the point is that how we speak tells a great, a huge amount of information. And it, so often, right now, if, this is a very hot topic. I, when I say hot topic, I mean a polarized topic. I'm talking about tracking people's information, knowing what they're saying, and, and I think that this is, an impro this is something that can have, you know, is, is something we all care about privacy, and we all care about, you know, in security of our data. And, but this is what I would say. There are many thorny topics here that, again, I think we are, in a stage where that revolution is going, revolution and evolution is going to happen. And we need to be proactive in how we're thinking about these things because 
these, the potential for the democratization of health diagnosis, for the potential for early intervention of medical conditions where there are treatments, and especially to people that might not even know that those treatments are available, is huge. And this is not to suggesting you replace a practitioner. This is as a way to inform people they should see a practitioner. I mean, there are ways to do this, there are ways to protect things, but the opportunity and the cost are there where we have to look and solve these thorny issues, because I truly believe they're worth the effort. The chemical composition of our breath gives away our emotions. We broad, we, there's a dynamic mixture of carbon dioxide, acetone, and isoprene that changes when our muscles tense and when our heart speeds up, and all without any, any obvious change in our behaviors. Um, we have used uh, carbon dioxide and track carbon dioxide levels to be able to show when people are uh, in, a, in a theater or in a space, you can see suspense, you can see fear. And this is all in our exhalant. Uh, one thing that I thought was a, a group used chemical exhalant and looked at different audiences watching the Hunger Games and <laughs> with com perfect visual reproduction, um, uh, uh, visual identification and obviously computational they could isolate and know exactly where, the dre where Katniss's dress caught on fire if you happen to see Hunger Games, because the audience reacted in a way that could be seen, it could be, f could be sensed in their breath. We broadcast a chemical signature of our emotions. So I do believe it's the end of the poker face. And we are entering the post-poker face era, and our technology will know what we're feeling. It will know more about us than it ever has. But this gives us, it does come with great opportunity, it also comes with great responsibility. I believe we have the opportunity and a capacity to become technological empaths. And we're entering what I call an era, the era of the empath, where we can connect more deeply with each other and with more deeply with our technology. And it can better represent each of us. And this is important. There is great opportunity here. It will change how we interact with each other. It will change how we interact with technology. But I, I want to make a, a clear distinction. When I say empathetic, that we're entering the era of the empath and what I call empathetic technology, I'm not saying it's, it's not about technology tracking us. That's not the important part. That's, it's technology becoming a partner with us. And it's all about how technology will make use to know to what it knows about us to react to us. Technology becomes an interface. It becomes an interface where that interface used to not pay attention to our internal states, to our cognitive load or our feelings, and it becomes an interface that bridges our external world with our internal one. And when we talk about, I've heard people on the stage talking about bias in AI, well, there's, and, and that's, a, that's an important thing. Our, our future is, but personalizing your technology is probably the most important way to get around bias in AI. Personalized our technology is fundamental to all of these changes that we can have. It's fundamental to en en enabling the benefit of a technology to reach each of us. I anticipate one of uh, uh, sensors moving, and this is happening, sensors moving off of our bodies so that we're not tethered, we're not, we don't have sensors in us, instead they're around us, and they're responsive to our internal state simply by tracking these pieces of information. Because most of the things I've talked about, can the information about your internal state is from the amalgamation of these different pieces of input coming that are picking up on changes, deterministic changes in my biology, but integrating them with microphones, with scene awareness. And suddenly I have a pretty rich picture of what's going on. And I can modulate my space to my intent, to my cognitive capacity, to assure that I'm, you know, whether I'm changing the temperatures, the sounds, the lights, the, the entire environment, my space becomes a dynamic relationship that I have, that I have, it has to be trusted, but that's helping me optimize my cognitive capacity, my physical capacity, and my biological capacity. So when we think about all the capacity for understanding our chemical interactions, we do share so much of what we're looking at is about looking at the correlations 
with signatures from those chemical interactions, which we might not find truly in, in a lab, but we definitely find a lot of these correlated signatures that tell us. But whether we've under explained the underlying neural correlates of these chemical signatures, it's about harnessing the potential of these different correlated signatures to increase our communication with, and with one another. And here's a particular thing that I think is, is going to transform, you know, and it's often the case that you see things, you know, bleeding edge te te technologies aimed at bioprecision medicine showing up in one place, but the transformation happens when they start affecting us in a consumer, in the consumer technology space and in how we socially communicate. So Stanford, uh, they released, a, they, they had a press release about a, a patch you can wear that will measure glucocorticoids, measure your cortisol levels. Right. So cortisol levels are highly associated with changes in mental state, with stress. They're also, you know, chronic stress and in, in elevated cortisol levels um, are indicated for uh, speeding up conditions of Parkinson's, of Ar Alzheimer's, of many conditions that we want to avoid. And you can imagine that these, you know, the future, it, our chemical signatures become part of how we interact with each other and part of our and alter our behaviors in terms of what we're broadcasting and communicating. It's a far away place, but maybe not so far. Again, I think these are topics that we have to have the right discussion. We have very polarized discussions right now, and it's, it's so important to think about the fact that every technology will change our behavior. And if we try to, if we're concerned about whether it will or not, we're missing the, the picture, which is we need to know it will change our behavior and think about how we want that to change. We get to be proactive in this discussion. I, I, you know, something as simple as the start, you know, changes in medical advancement, right? They've enabled us to live longer. They've enabled us to recover from certain diseases. Th those things are all, we can track those. But they've also fundamentally changed us as humans with regard to how we engage, how we think about what it means to engage and what we're willing to engage with. If you think about something like, because you know, we, we, trust, we trust medicine can fix us in ways it didn't used to be able to. So that's enabled us to push the limits and the capacity of human performance in ways that we never would have 100 years ago. Would the X Games exist if the risk of breaking an arm were the same as it was 100, year, were 100 years ago? Well, it wouldn't, I'm sure. But it, they do because we have, we're in an era that I like to say we don't believe, um, we no longer believe Humpty and du Humpty Dumpty can't be put back together again. Instead, we trust that he can. And it changes what we're, where our criterion is set for what we establish as a human, human expecta our expectations of human performance. And these evolutions will happen over and over, but I believe we're in a critical one right now. And if we think about uh, you know, this, the scary part of any technology like this, I promise that any technology can be used and have very deleterious effects on society and culture. If we look at something as simple as um, a, a, an innocuous benign technology, one would think of uh, face beautification uh, software that, you know, to do, take augmented selfies. But something like this has actually led to lower self-esteem, sense of issues with empowerment, uh, the lower self-worth, depression. This is probably the most important part of how we think about the future with so many opportunities right now towards how we evolve technology, which is anything we introduce will evolve our technology will evolve, and when I say evolve, it will evolve our behaviors. It will change our behaviors. It will change how we interact with each other. My work at Stanford has uh, spent a lot of time, I'm a neurophysiologist in the background, but at Stanford I focus a lot on uh, the, the implications of technology, immersive technology on neuroplasticity, and how that relationship is. In the sense that we have the opportunity, and we need to realize we do, to to change our brains in ways that uh, we want to see the world change, because they're going to change regardless. That's not something we get to look at and say it isn't going to happen. Plasticity is our most powerful tool. And in, we get to shape and evolve our technology, and we get to realize that our technologies, we want to have the foresight to look towards what that evolution is and should be. We'll get it wrong sometimes, but we need to start there and l try to anticipate that. It's a post-poker -poker face era. It's time to think to accept that. 
and move towards a future where empathetic technologies can interact with our internal states. Technology is going to know more about us than it ever has. It's an unprecedented level. But it also means that for the first time, technology has the capacity to actually benefit each of us individually with each of our uniqueness to be the most impactful, the most optimized, and the most enhancing. So thank you. Thank you.